And we're live. Okay, I'd like to welcome everybody to the October 17th meeting of the Student Life and Athletics Committee of the University of Rhode Island Board of Trustees. The meeting is being held uh, in person and also remotely. Live streaming is available for anybody that wants it on uh, via YouTube. At this time, I'll call a, uh, a roll call attendance. I'll ask Michelle to uh, call out the names if you're here. Really uh, say yes, in, in whether on website or in person. Tom sure. Ryan. Here, virtually. David Moderano. Uh, here, virtually. Margot Cook. Michael Fasciatelli. Here, virtually. Robbie Luna. Michael McNally. Here, virtually. Jay Placenzia. Hannah Backer. Here, virtually. And Mark Palange. Here, WebEx. Thank you. We have a quorum. Okay, a reminder for the benefit of our audience and the note taker, please identify yourself if you have any comments or questions or decide to make a motion. Uh, participants using the WebEx are required to keep their cameras on and be in full sight view. Um, so that everybody can hear and see you. Uh, at this time, I'd like to acknowledge that the University of Rhode Island occupies the traditional homeland of the Narragansett Nation and the Niantic people. Um, are there any proposed amendments to the published agenda? If there are no opposed uh, amendments, hearing none, the first item on the agenda will be the approval of the minutes. May I have a motion that the Student Life, Student Life and Athletics Committee uh, approve the minutes of the last meeting? David Monterano, so moved. Is your second? Uh, Mike McDowell, second. Okay. No move, all the minutes are approved. We have, Michelle, we need to approve the 23rd minutes, or is that okay? Uh, I think we're okay. Those were the ones that we approved. Okay, Jane, uh, perfect. Yep. Okay, great. Okay. Um, we don't, as we discussed earlier, we don't have any votes today, um, but we will hear a, an update uh, from Ellen Reynolds on housing and residential life. And then Michael Giacotta will talk to us about uh, what's going on with public safety in the university. Uh, where we stand and some of the challenges and what we'll have to do going forward. Obviously, we all know housing is a, a challenge for the university. We're proposing we're hopefully we'll be building two new dorms um, and we'll get more of our students on campus, which will help just campus life in general and I think uh, the student experience overall. So that's our goal. So with that, I will uh, turn it over to uh, to Ellen. Thank you, Tom. Just a second, Katie's sharing the slide deck. We'll be ready to go. So it's my absolute pleasure to be here today to tell you a little bit about housing and residential life, provide an update, and certainly take on any questions or comments that folks have. I hope to run through um, some occupancy numbers and, and provide you where we're at as of fall 2022 little bit about our student demographics and those residing with us on campus. We'll talk about our resident assistants and our resident academic mentors, also known as RAMs, review some of the financials associated with HRL, our facilities, and then what's next. So moving forward, uh, let me tell you a little bit about our occupancy. We provided some history here just so you could see where we've been. And we looked back to fall 2019, right? Prior to the pandemic, we were sitting at about 5,500 students who were living at the University of Rhode Island in, in um, university owned housing. And then you can see what happened, right? Look at fall 2020 and spring 2021. So if you remember in March of 2020, that's when we needed to switch to remote learning. And the following year, we had some real strong mitigation um, protocols in place. Uh, we had a limiting number of students who could come to campus, go in and out of each other's residence halls. And therefore what we recognized were some students chose to remain home and not live in housing. And so um, 
I will also say that traditionally, if you can see from fall to spring, we normally see a drop anywhere between nine and 10% um, in our occupancy. What we're seeing right now, though, is really only a drop of about 7%. I'll also say that uh, when you think about 17,000 students, we're really only housing right now about 30% of the students from the university. So what is that? Why is that? Do students want to just go off campus in the spring? Yeah, so no, they don't go off campus actually. There's some melt with that. So it's students who don't come back with yeah. December grads. So think about the 4.5 year students. So there's a natural number of reasons why students um, don't continue. And we don't bring in the same number in the spring either. So how, the number of graduates don't always equal how many students are transferring in for the spring. And not 18. And yeah, as Frank was saying, that's very common um, across uh, institutions. Now, are you required to live on campus both freshman and sophomore year, or is it just freshman? Great question, Mike. You're actually not required at the University of Rhode Island to live any year on campus. But I will tell you, we have 90, 94 to 95 percent of our first year students who live with us, and then you know about five percent that commute or live in their family home, and then uh, that number decreases every year after that, drops as a sophomore, and then certainly as a junior and senior simply based on our housing, but also uh, the interest in students to live what we refer to as down the line, right? There's a, a natural interest to live in these some of these homes in our local community um, and uh, with their friends and enjoy some of the community outside of um, the University of Rhode Island. We'll talk in a minute, though, about that changing and students now wanting to come back to campus. So let me tell you where we sit right now in the fall. That's a quick question. Can you, can oh, you go, sure. back one, one, go back one slide? Okay, happy to. <coughs> So, so quick question, the, the 55 in the fall of 2019 and, and to now we're 52, do we, was that like triples or doubles or, or is it, are people like, we have availability or is it just, we just have such so much capacity? I mean, in terms of people coming to the, to the university. So like, can we house 6,000 kids or no 5,500? It's like, what is our optimal or max? That's a great question, David. So yes, the 5,500 was employing triples. Triple. And ideally, we wouldn't want to have to triple, right? We triple because we don't have enough capacity. Got it. Got it. Okay. So those numbers are including triples. And you see this year, where we look at right now, when I get here at 5380 is where we sit. That's as of October 12th. Um, so that's really looking at all of the occupancy we, that we have. Um, we do have some students who have already left, but with the number of offers that were out with students to live with us, that's about the number in doubles. Because remember, when we had to make the decision last I would say mid semester in December about tripling this year. Omicron had just come on the scene. We were seeing a new variant of concern. So we made the cautious decision to continue without triples for this year. We did yeah. eventually yeah. offer some voluntary triples. But um, as we talk about what's next, I'll, I'll um, uh, outline a little bit of what our hope is for fall 2023, which will include tripling again because of the demand of the number of students who want and need to live with us on campus. So that's a great question. Here's some demographics of those who are living with us. 50, 58% identify as women, 40% identify as men, and then 2% identify as uh, genderqueer, non-binary, trans man or woman, and, or did not specify. You can see the ethnicity. 80% um, uh, are white, 7% are black, 6% Hispanic, 4% Asian, and 3% American Indian, Pacific Islander, or, or did not specify. 61% are out of state, no surprise there, and 39% are Rhode Island residents. I want to talk a little bit about what our housing team did working with our admissions folks and other partners across campus this year and bringing our students back. So what they, we worked really closely with our Road to Becoming a RAM committee and making sure that we had a seamless transition from the time that they were accepted, came to Welcome Day, moved through orientation in June, and then intentionally planning for their return back to campus. Um, uh, many of our staff and faculty and deans and president were there out there welcoming our students when they arrived. We also brought our first year students back two days in advance so that they could have some time alone before our sophomores, juniors, and seniors arrived. Because what we what we were hearing is that allowed our students to develop this real strong sense of belonging and identity and community before the influences of the returning students happened. 
We also had Roadie Fest, and I can just tell you the energy was um, amazing. We had over 100 different student organizations, many of our colleagues across campus out there. Um, we lined the walk from the Memorial Union all the way to the Union, and it was a great chance for our students to really um, become engaged, uh, uh, evaluate different organizations they wanted to belong to, and, and really get a sense of community. I'll also show the picture on the bottom down there are OWLs, and those are Orientation Week leaders. Those are some of the most uh, exceptional students who helped us welcome back our new students. They had programs that were taking them to the beach, down to the sailing center to uh, paddleboard or uh, learn how to sail. Um, we had movies on the quad, um, DJs until 1 a.m. So there was a lot of excitement in bringing back our class this year. The other thing I will say, some of the challenges that we had with the fall 2022 was particularly around the fact that we had returning students last spring who wanted to come back to campus that we weren't able to accommodate. So, um, and this wasn't unique to URI. This was across the country. We saw a higher demand post pandemic, more students wanting to return back to campus. We opened up our applications last spring and we had over 800 students who wanted to live at the university. Um, and unfortunately, we weren't able to accommodate all of those. Um, some, some, we believe some of that has to do with the actual housing market that was out there. If you can recall, houses were selling over asking price, right? We know some of those were rental properties that are no longer, were no longer available to our students. The other thing that happened is um, one of the local towns in Narragansett passed a new ordinance that limited the number of um, college students living together to three. That had a significant impact on the availability of off-campus housing for our students as well. Currently, that ordinance is on hold based on a, a determination made by a judge, but we'll see where that plays out and if there is um, an appeal to that, how that will uh, continue to further impact us as well. So moving right along, I want to spotlight some of the um, best parts of our job, and that is working with resident assistants. So RAs, we have about 149 of them who live with us on campus um, and in the residence hall. They receive, for doing that work, they receive a room waiver, so the cost of a traditional room, and they also receive a stipend for the work that they do. They work on average, I would say, about 20 hours a week doing all sorts of activities in support of our students. So making sure that our students feel welcome, they're making connections, they're finding um, all of the accommodations they need on campus. They're helping them um, learn how to live in an inclusive environment. Uh, they work on uh, roommate conflicts and um, all other things that new students are learning as they're living in the residence hall or even returning students who are living in the residence halls. We have a resident to RA ratio of 36 to 1. And you'll see there some of the comments about our um, RAs have made about the role that they serve. It really is highly competitive. Just so you know, we receive applications. Students, um, our RAs need to have a minimum of a 2.5 GPA. They had to have lived on campus for the two semesters. Um, so they have to know what living on campus is like. They have to be full-time students. Um, they have to be available to work those hours that we spoke about. They also have to be available to come to campus a couple weeks early in August because we spend two weeks training them in leadership and uh, conflict resolution and, and how they can best support their students um, in the residence hall that they, they support. Um, and it's a great uh, leadership opportunity, peer mentor opportunity that many students um, value and uh, apply to become part of. What's the average? What's the average grade for the R, uh, the RA, and, and is that thirty six to one pretty common or average? That that um, that rate that ratio is actually a, a tad bit better than a Kuho I, which is our housing standard. So it's pretty par for an organization our size, institution our size. Tom, that's a great question. Thank and you. the GPA means they have to have a minimum of a two point five to participate. But many of our students are above that. I don't have the average GPA for that, but I can check if I can get that. But I mean, are they sophomores, juniors more? They are. They have to be sophomores or above. That's correct when they apply. They have to be in good standing. Um, they have to have, a, you know, a cleared student conduct record uh, in good academic. Um, and we so have a mix of diversity. We do. It's incredible. Uh, again, I don't have those exact numbers okay. in front of me. They represent the university population. They do, exactly. So they, they mirror what our community looks like in the way of the student population. So Great. about 25% of them are individuals of color from diverse backgrounds. Great. All Thank the you. professors. Um, 
So now resident academic mentors, RAMS. So those are our, our partners with the academic program and they help um, with our first year students in the living learning communities. So a living learning community is really the residential community dedicated to a specific academic major um, or college. And so we, for our first year students, most of them come in, if not all of them come in through the living learning community. We even have living learning communities for undecided students, just so you know. And these um, individuals work along with the RAs, but they also work along with a partner from our academic uh, program to make sure that our students are, um, have opportunities for study groups, are figuring out what they need to in the way of their schedules, um, uh, working towards the academic success for the student while they're here in residence and building a lot of programs and events to support that. They bring in um, individuals who do educational programs, lectures, um, all sorts of things to make sure that the students feel um, academically supported in their living learning environment as well. And they receive a stipend, uh, a, a, I shouldn't say a stipend, a waiver on their room rate, and they work on average about 12 hours a week during the academic year. So now I'm just going to go through quickly just a little bit about the HRL finances, right? So they, HRL is classified as an auxiliary. What that means at the University of Rhode Island is they're completely self-funded. And as you can see, they're primarily their funding comes from rentals. So if you look on the blue side of the screen or to the left, what you'll see is personnel and fringe is about $13.5 million in their budget. Um, that is about 27%. Operating is 33.9 million, um, about 70%, uh, and the um, capital is about 3% or 1.3 million for a total budget of 48.8 million in fiscal year 2023. If you look over on the other side, you'll see their revenue, right? So they bring in about 45.7 million in rental rates. Uh, grad and faculty rental, a little bit more than 800,000. There's a communication fee that students pay, and that allows for the infrastructure for Wi-Fi and hardware to be in place to be able to support students, and that's about 900,000. And then right now, for this year, we've allocated about 525 and bringing in for summer housing and rentals and conferences. But prior to the pandemic, we had aimed always for about a million dollars in the housing budget for that, and then some additional revenue. So overall, the total budget for housing is about $48.8 million. Currently, right now, they're sitting on a fund balance of about $20 million. Again, we need to have reserves in place to be able to cover any un unplanned um, occurrences. But we also need to have that funding in place because that's primarily what funds many of our capital projects, OK? So I wanted to put in there a little bit about the COVID impact. If you look down bottom, you'll see for the two years, fiscal year 28 to 22, the revenue impact. If you recall back when we looked at the numbers of people in housing back during the pandemic, we recognized about a $22.4 million loss in revenue from students living in housing. We also recognized about a $7.6 million increase, and that was in large part due to a cost of paying for the hotels for isolation and quarantine, additional cleaning, um, and other things to support the, the response to the pandemic. So housing was hit particularly hard during COVID uh, with about a total deficit of $30 million. Um, some of that was mitigated, fortunately, with some of the relief funds that came in, um, the uh, COVID relief fund and also the American Rescue Fund uh, mitigated that loss at about $13.5 million. So the total deficit they recognized due to COVID was about $16.5 million. And what I'll say is that $20 million fund balance right now is completely allocated, totally allocated to capital projects that are underway or soon to be underway or in the beginning stages of being planned. And those include things like uh, graduate village renovations, sprinklers, um, roofs being replaced, uh, flooring, interior and exterior um, uh, improvements to some of our halls, uh, generator um, project in our complex area, different things like that that need to continue to happen. We have a, um, a great deal of deferred maintenance and uh, we need to continue to make sure that our residence halls, even with some of the age that they are, continue to um, provide students with the very best experience while they're at the university. Primarily infrastructure. So if we're moving forward now, looking at um, some of those facilities, and some of you who attended here will recognize some of these um, facilities. We have some dated facilities and we have some, some newer facilities. So we'll talk a little bit about what that looks like. Most of our first year students live in um, what we would say double rooms in a corridor style hall. Um, and then we certainly have connected style uh, housing available, towers, suites, apartments, 
and then certainly graduate and family housing. So take a minute and look at the fact that we have 26 different residence halls available on campus uh, for a total of about 5,500, a little bit more than 5,500 students. Um, and those are traditional in doubles, as we're talking about, or single apartments, but the total number without looking at tripling. Um, I'm really happy to, to um, articulate that we have a Talent Development Achievement House. It is in one of the older facilities on campus. It's a former Greek facility on Upper College Road. It was also the former Women's Center. But we have 37 TD scholars living in that space right now. Um, and then if you take a look down there, we have 12 Carter styled, Adams, Aldridge, Barlow. I won't go through the list of them. Many of those residence halls date back to the 1950s, 1960s, 70s. And then we have some newer halls, and those are predominantly in the suites and apartment styles. Um, in 2007, we added Wiley, Garrahi, Eddy. In 2012, we brought on Hillside. We still reference Hillside as one of our newer halls, um, but it's hard to believe that it was 2012 when that came online. Mm -hmm. And then in the middle of the pandemic, the 2020, we brought on Bookside, uh, which is really popular, and a nice new um, facility, apartment style, uh, kitchens, um, and the students seem to really really um, enjoy that facility located across from the football stadium. So moving forward, I just wanted to show a little bit about the, uh, the, the staff doing the good work down there, led by Frankie Miner, who's the AVP and uh, Director of Housing. But we have an incredible but lean team that does the work in supporting our students in the, in the housing and residential life. And uh, we're really proud of how hard they are working to make sure that we have safe, comfortable um, facilities available for students and also looking to see where we can grow that. So as we move forward and look at what's next, let me walk you through a couple of things we're doing. One is we're working with our campus partners in capital planning on a master housing study, right? We need to understand our needs. We need to do a needs assessment. We need to look at what a, a program and a plan looks like, and then we need to have a strategy around how we're going to implement that. Um, so that is in the works right now. We're actually actively out for an RFP and should hear soon about that. But in the meantime, we're also moving forward with new construction for undergraduate residence, uh, a residence hall. We're not, we, we don't really need to wait on the study. We know right now we have a demand for it. We need to move forward with it. So again, um, working with our partners in capital planning, we did receive a Krishner's to uh, go ahead and get uh, Ryback bonds to borrow to construct a new um, undergraduate housing. And we're looking right now at what type of residence hall that will be, where it will go, what it will look like, and beginning to understand that. Certainly trying to do that as uh, quickly and efficiently as we can. But I also want to say that we have to make sure that we can financially afford it and our students can financially afford it. Right now is not a great time to be in the construction market with many of the uh, new construction coming in over an original cost. Um, so we're working through that as well. We're also looking at it, investing in upgrading our graduate housing. We know that there's a need for additional graduate housing. Historically, we've not had long, long lists for graduate housing. And now I know our numbers are over 100 graduate students on our waiting list. Um, we know that certainly President Parlange and, and the institution would like to grow some of our graduate studies. But in able to do that, we need to have um, uh, reasonably priced, affordable housing available to our graduate students and their families as well. So looking at prioritizing that to the best of our ability and how we can uh, move forward. We're also working with our housing team to implement two studies coming this spring. One of them is going to be really, it's called the College Housing Index, and that's really data points, right? Really analyzing number and data comparison with peer and like institutions. But we're also looking at a Sky Factor survey where we can really assess how our students um, experience, what our students think about their experience and their satisfaction. So we have some national uh, benchmarking data along that as well. And then I'm going to conclude with fall 2023, because believe it or not, we're well into the planning for what next fall is going to look like and how we're going to move forward with that. We've made some key decisions working with our admissions partners and enrollment management on, on how we're going to increase our availability for housing for our sophomores through seniors, because we know that there's a need. We need to, to do the best we can to try to maximize our housing over the next couple of years uh, to make sure that we have enough for everybody who wants to live on campus. So the way we're going to do that is strategically look at adding back some triples, not 100% um, triples by any means, but in our first year students, um, we're going to add uh, three residence halls um, that will allow us to um, maximize um, some of our availability. And, and, and we're going to also have some of our sophomore 
junior and senior housing that has some tripling capability as well. Overall, what we hope will happen is we'll accomplish about 600 additional beds available on campus to meet that need um, based on what students select. And it will be, as I said, in those uh, facilities that best accommodate triple and are most sought after. So either the newer facilities or those that have elevators and air conditioning. Um, but we understand that we're we we're really trying to make sure that we don't we don't have the um, huge list that we had this fall. We'll still probably have a list, but hopefully we can mitigate that list to our best of our ability. We also know that cost of attendance is a real concern for families as well. And so when we triple, there's also a cost discount and there's a 20 percent discount to all students living in that triple. So for some of our students and families uh, it will also provide some relief for them as it relates to the cost of attendance at the university. And I think that's all I have for housing at this time, but I'm happy to take any questions. And as I said, the AVP and director, uh, Frankie Miner is here as well, if there's something uh, more specific that I can answer. Yeah, I had a, I had a question, it's Tom Ryan. Um, when we look at this master housing study, um, I assume we're going to look at the space needs, the amenities, of what the students are looking for in the next three to five to seven years, how the dorms would be laid out differently. And then also that's one question. And second question is what's the what's the goal? How many do we want to have live on campus? I mean, some of it we're not going to be able to control, but I think the surrounding communities of URI, there's going to be a shrinking amount of uh, housing off campus housing and people are using it more people are moving down staying full time in the narragansett south kingston community your point about the value of the houses so i think we should i don't know what it what the what the answer is but i'd like to discuss that and also um are we going to include public private partnerships in the residential uh community you know that i know blackstone's doing a lot of this other universities are doing it there's pros and cons to this, obviously, but um, you know we've always been land land rich and cash poor at the university, so that may be an opportunity to to do some of these uh, partnerships. So great questions. Let me just start with first the master housing study. Yes, it, it's going to need to do all of that. It's going to have to really do focus groups with a lot of different org, um, people and and you know um, students and what their needs are today and what they want to see in the housing that they're living in, what type of housing they'd like. Um, we also will have them you know they'll look at some of the. Um, uh, data points that are out there already about the market conditions. So we understand best, you know, what can we afford to build? And then next, where do we build it on our campus? Where do we build out and continue to work um, to be able to do that? So we're hoping that that master plan does all of that and, and helps us make some real strategic um, plans around housing here on campus. What type of housing is also included in that study? So it will be, is it housing that the University of Rhode Island bills uh, using Ryback bonds? Is it, um, a, as you said, a private public partnership where we can do it and we have the land and somebody else uses um, but is able to build it. Um, all of that will be evaluated. We'll also look at, do we build traditional housing that is intended to last 70 or 80 years? Or do we look at building something that's less, um, that is, has a shorter um, maybe life expectancy, but may be able to be less expensive or um, quicker to, to, um, to completion. So all of that, I think, will be part of that study and, and trying to evaluate what our needs are. But even with that, we already know we need additional beds. So we're already looking to move forward. Um, Tom, to your point of how many, uh, all I can say is, you know, we'll, we'll try to get some of that information from the study, but it's, it's variable, right? It's what's the market outside? How far are people willing to travel? We do know that um, it's a national trend right now for students post COVID to want to move back to campus and have that sense of community. Um, and to that point, we'd like to be able to have the housing to be able to meet their needs. But we also know that we're going to need to, to build up some of our additional infrastructure because when students live on campus, there's additional needs, right? So all of those things that contribute. So maybe some additional dining seats are going to be necessary to make sure that there's not, you know, now we're not overrunning our dining facilities. Um, uh, health health needs, um, you know, now that they're on campus, they may not go to a, another um, setting to receive health care. They may be coming back to campus. So uh, counseling, all of those type of things will be impacted as well as we grow the on-campus population. 
but right. things that we'll, we'll, we'll look at. And then um, you asked about the P3, and I think we answered that. Yes, that's certainly in the mix to explore and evaluate um, if that's a possibility. What's the timing on the study? Uh, sh as we heard from our campus planning partners, uh, sh should be any day that we're hearing who's awarded it, and then we're hearing about six months or eight months in, we should be getting some results back. So about six or eight months is what we're hearing. Thank you. You're welcome. Can I Sure. Um, again, this is Frankie Miner. I'm um, the, the housing guy. Um, just want to let you know, I'm only five years at University of Rhode Island, but 40 plus years in this field and work extensively with our national and international association. The challenges that URI is facing are not unique, but I can tell you in my career that the housing situation off campus for URI is very unique given we've got a very old community and, and stuff like that. So I can reassure you that the market study is going to look at our unique situation. Uh, one of the things we're concerned about is many of these uh, consultants will utilize kind of boilerplate language they right. use for institutions. We have a very unique situation, so we need to understand very clearly what's the impact on our housing market, what's the demand, and the type of housing that we're going with. Uh, primarily, our goal is not to necessarily capture more of the off-campus market, but uh, accommodate the current demand for our students who want to live on campus, which will probably be realizing in uh, suite style and apartment style housing, but we'll wait to the market study to confirm. But yeah, we need to make sure that we are not only designing facilities that we can afford, but that may be desirable for our students for, for, for the future years. Great. Good to hear. Uh -huh. I'm surprised that the private sector hasn't got involved and built. Uh, there must be barriers somehow with zoning or something. The private sector hasn't built an apartment complex there with retail and uh, the rest of it right adjacent to the campus because they've got 10,000 people that it makes, you know, and if it was a quality experience, uh, you drive people back to the university with quality housing, retail, places to go, things to do. I'm just surprised the private sector hasn't jumped in. Mr. McNally, I think that's a, a very a profound observation in the sense that given that many other institutions that I've worked, I've exposure to, yeah, you'd have the private uh, companies out there, national ones, well-affiliated, reputable organizations coming to, uh, to tap into this. I, I can only speculate it's zoning or other types of situations that may have prohibited that because the economic factors are there. I uh, think we, I think in fairness, we've been hesitant and less open to it. Hmm than some other universities. Yeah, I'm, I'm new to the university and happy to do that. I'm just able to bring some, some both a, uh, an experience and but recognizing that every campus is unique and we need to define a, a plan that's unique to meet the needs of that campus. And the off-campus experience is gonna get more and more expensive. Yes. Yeah, and that's exactly what we found, Mike, um, particularly with the limited number of people in housing. You know, when you think about some of these houses had six bedrooms, but only three could be rented, that impact was profound for our students. Do you have the economics around if for every hundred more students that live on campus, eat on campus, what's the what's the financial impact? We yeah, better so yeah. we're just starting, Tom, looking at that right now because as we start to add five hundred more, we want to know what that threshold is to now when we have to add more dining facilities. So we're working with some of the national studies to see if we can figure out what that looks like. But also knowing, just so you know, that the apartment style students have different type of meal plans, right? Because they have kitchens, they do community meals. That's part of what they enjoy is that they can do some cooking in there. So it's going to be interesting to see what that threshold puts us over the edge for having to, to develop more dining facilities or seats in dining facilities so that we can accommodate the demand. Uh, the only point that I would like to point out is that, and, and when Ellen was talking about our plans for future development of housing, mm -hmm. uh, we need to be realistic in terms of just that. We're looking at two and a half years at the earliest before an occupancy date uh, for that, and that would be optimistic. So um, what we're working on, as she's outlined, is our intermediate steps to try to manage our occupancy until we can get to a point at that point. But in terms of adding supplemental housing, we're two to three years out for doing that. I just want to make sure we're kind of realistic. No matter what the delivery method, P3 might deliver something a little bit sooner than that. Traditional uh, funding may a little bit later, but uh, I just want to make sure we're aware of the time. So this is a long-term and both an e intermediate-term situation that we're trying to resolve. I don't know. Let's get that student housing uh, grant. Then we then we do double the number of units in, at the end of the year with that financial commitment from the state. I'm sorry, Mr. Pashtelli, I didn't hear your question clearly. I thought we had gotten that grant. We did, Mike. 
Yeah, so we got the Kushners that are proud, uh, allows us to borrow that money. Thank you. you. You worked through with Abby Ryder to get that. So I think it's about $170 million that we're able to borrow up to um, to be able to. But it won't be again to, to Frankie's point. It won't be deliverable for several years um, once we decide what we're building, what the design looks like, where it's going. Um, and that's if we're to do it ourselves. Are we are we, are we focusing on that? I know the committee approved that. Are we focusing on that? Because it, it obviously it'll take a year to design and plan it. If we're, if we're going to waste a year or two before we get to that point, what's our timing for that? Well, we've started already, to be honest with you. We're working almost immediately on that because what we're trying to understand is what what we can afford. And so, again, because we had it's it's being called Brookside too. We'll we'll change the name at some point, but because we had that recent um, build of the 500 beds, working off that, we can kind of get some idea of what different type housing will cost us per square footage. Just know it's very different than the market of 2020. And of course, what we're seeing is really increased cost to build at this point in time. So we need to figure out what we can actually afford um, because as an auxiliary, again, we have to be able to afford it um, through that. Our students budget. Afford. Yeah. Hey, hey, Mark, I'd just like to suggest, because <clears throat> I know we've been talking about private public partnerships for a long time around dormitories, uh, parking garages, and so it seems to me we should we should do this in parallel. I know the work that's going on now with with the Brookside Two, but we should bring a private player to come in here or two that can assess this and give us um, their take on it and the economics around it. We could do it simultaneously. For three years, I know, I know it's going to meet the supply chain issues, construction, but if we get a private partnership, I think it may be quicker, or at least we, we can understand the economics uh, sooner than later. I don't know. Who We're uh, Tom uh, for sure. Uh, we are very open to it. At many, you know, we need a student center, as Mike McNally said earlier. We have thousands of people. It's not only the students; it's also the staff and the, right. and the faculty. Um, so th this is certainly high priority. But Mike Fest, Mike Fasatelli, we could get some players to come in and take a look at this, couldn't we? Yeah, yeah. There's a whole bunch of people. Right. That, yeah. That, as people have, Pete, Tom, people have done these. Some of them do them on campus, some do off campus. There's joint right. venture structures, right. there's deals. I mean, they they go to the bank and they borrow money. They got a, they have a guaranteed income stream with the students. Yeah, like Centennial and and and, and yeah, that's why I yeah, ask. Some people sometimes the university has a policy that forces people to live on campus. So allocation. So this has been done, you know, in many universities on the university land and right next to the university in many cases by, you know. By in partnership, so there's a lot of structures to this. There's definitely, definitely demand for it. American campus community's done a lot. There's been a lot of people who've done this. Okay, uh, at time on a my old life, we used to do it. Uh, right. right, we used to build them, finance them, and then we would flip them to an investment and then operate them. Yeah, I mean, I mean, Gilbane did the one right near Brown. That was not right. Brown's housing, but right, if you know Mike, you know the one right on Thea Street. Now it's unbelievably successful. Focus on graduate. Then Brown went ahead and did a, pro, a pro, did a joint venture on the next one because they saw the success of the Gilbane project. So, yeah. I mean, there's definitely the definitely ways, different ways to structure and move it along faster. Yeah, there's going be a lot of people that would be interested. We should just have that in one of our future uh, agendas to see kind of where we're at around this. Okay, any other questions? I just had a brief one time. The the if I read that slide a few slides before the capital budget was one point three million dollars, which seems really really low for having twenty six assets like that. It's like fifty thousand each. You could barely replace yeah. the ground floor carpet for that. Uh, I, I I I I is that all the capital? So, Mike, I will just say that was really because uh, until just recently, we didn't have even the 20 million because the money was used due to COVID and the deficits that we experienced. So that's all we had allocated for 23. We're going to do more than that. We have 20 million in fund balance that's going to allow us to do uh, much more than that. And traditionally, it is higher than that. It was just coming out of COVID, not having enough um, in reserves to, to budget for a great deal of projects. But we are now in a in a better financial state, so we'll be doing more projects and using some of that twenty million in fund balance. All of it is actually earmarked for capital improvement. Okay. Thank you. 
before we move on, um, I actually just have a quick question. I don't want to open another can of worms, but being a student and having seen the state of the various different kinds of dorms, like going into a freshman, I was fortunate enough to live in Hillside. Um, and then I lived in Hopkins for a couple weeks and like just the difference in the state, like I understand Hillside is new compared to Hopkins, but just like the state of the buildings that they're in, especially for upperclassmen, like sophomores and up, they don't get necessarily like the nicer choice of buildings besides Brookside as a first choice because they want the freshmen to have like a good experience and have the nicer buildings. So is there any like form of hopes to renovate some of the older buildings or like specifically like Garrahy, um or Wiley, which are the apartment styles where people like upperclassmen want to live there and get a different experience of dorm life, but just like having them upgraded, I guess. So then the, like it's more enticing for the upperclassmen to live on campus because I know a lot of like my friends and myself, like we moved yeah. off campus because of like off campus life is very different to on campus, but just knowing that the buildings that we are living in are very like neglected almost because like Brookside is very competitive, so it's hard to get in, but like some of the buildings just feel very neglected when it comes to maintenance. So we don't want to live in those places. So I'm just curious if there's any hopes to renovate or just kind of clean them up. So then upperclassmen are feel more enticed to live on campus. Great question. Hannah, great question, and you're absolutely right. And when you look at some of the age of our facility, even when you maintain them and upgrade them, there's, you know, you get to the point at what point do you take something offline and, and build something new as opposed to continue to build them, right? When, when I talked about some of the ages of the facilities, I mean, some of them are, you know, 1950s, right? So how much longer do you continue to invest? And I think that's why we feel very confident we can't go wrong with adding 500 new new beds to campus because there's probably at some point we need to start pulling some of those uh, existing resources off and doing major renovations. Um, right now we can't do ma major renovations because we need every bed we have for somebody to be in in the fall. And so you can't get everything done that you need to get done in two months in the summer. It's just impossible. So you bring up a really good point. And I think, again, that's why we're moving forward with additional housing because um, we know we need to do some major renovations. We are doing renovations regularly, replacing roofs, uh, painting, carpet, um, bathrooms, all, all sorts of stuff. But it's, as you said, with a portfolio of 26 different halls, it's an impressive, um, an impressive list of things that have to be done and the timing of getting them done when students don't need to be in them. So. And Hannah, this is Frankie, just to your point, clearly we, part of that master plan study that we referred to the, is trying to understand from both a facilities point of view, the infrastructure, the building construction, the design, and students' popularity or their, their do they love those spaces or not, despite their, their, their warts, um, is going to be part of that critical analysis. Are these keepers or are the, that we reinvestment to upgrade uh, to, to current student standards, or are these facilities that we look at to potentially demolishing and, and repurposing with that. But as, as, as Dr. Reynolds talked about, affordability to our students, because we're a self-supporting auxiliary, when we say what we can afford, ultimately that means what students can afford. So that has to be factored uh, in, into that as well. Um, this isn't my first rodeo. I've been down this past before in a comprehensive plan. I'm looking forward to trying to uh, work with our master planners uh, to provide the best facilities that we can reasonably afford to our students with diversity of options that meet their needs for as long as they want to live on campus. It's a very broad statement, but that's what, how we're entering into this process, realizing we've got some, some facilities that are still enjoyed, but not they're, they're in need of attention. Um, but we're working on trying to do that, but also don't want to make sure that we're doing a good uh, investment of our limited capacity. Is this a, key, uh, this is a facility that has long-term capacity? Or is this a situation that's outlived its usefulness and we need to replace it with something that can meet those needs into URI's future? We don't have those answers yet. That's hopefully what part of the master plan study will uh, provide us better information on. Thank you. Hey, um, I, I, I've advocated for a while that we need to do this master plan you know, across the university. Because not only time you made a point, we found we did this in Rockville that People didn't want to live in these certain kinds of, they let the taste of what they were doing with more single units, right. separate bathrooms. The product itself that we had was not really being hotly coveted mm -hmm. by the students, especially graduate students. So I think using, looking at the inventory and looking at the future and having a 10, 20 year kind of vision, we know will be wrong. And then matching it up and seeing what it holds is really something we need to do. 
I couldn't agree more. I mean, we have lim we got limited resources, but if we were to wipe the slate clean, and you know, there's a certain amount of nostalgia, but you can't help but knocking down Browning and Adams. And I mean, uh, the, these, some of these places, even though we renovated, but it seems to me that I don't, I don't pick on Browning and Adams. I lived in Adams, so, so maybe it's okay. But the the um, <laughs> seems to me we, we, there should every year there should be dormitory work being done, either either buildings being built or buildings being knocked down and renovated or renovated dramatically gutted. You know, I know we have to take them offline, but you know, it's, there's, there's no successful college that doesn't have cranes and, and construction on it everywhere, every day. So, and now I know we, we have a challenge with money, but uh, I think we should at least lay it out and then see what we can, what we can afford and how we can maybe attack it differently from a financial perspective. And I, I, I just can't believe the private markets, they may not be as, as lucrative and beneficial as they were because of rates and costs, but I think they'll still be right. And the fact that we can get more people on campus is I think beneficial for the student experience. Okay, um, any other questions? Seeing none, hearing none. Um, thank you, Ellen. Thank you. Uh, Michael, campus safety and security update. Thank you, Tom. I'm, <laughs> we're just going to load it up here and I'll be right with you. <laughs> Perfect. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for uh, giving me some time. With me today is uh, well, for those that don't know me, my name is Mike Jagoda. I'm the Director of Public Safety, Chief of Police. I've been appointed in that position for just over a year now. Um, to my right with me today is Captain Mike Shalik. Um, Mike is a former police chief in Cranston, and he's in charge of um, security and safety at all our satellite campuses, as well as our detective unit, and he's in charge of supervising all our criminal investigations. So I'm mainly going to talk today about the annual security report, the 2021, uh, which we just posted. We were required to uh, put that online. Um, I wish we were in person. I could give you a, a hard copy of that. But if you go onto our website, either the public safety website or our police website, our annual security report for 2021, along with the two previous years, um, are on there. So the annual security report contains useful information about how the university works in partnership to educate all members of the community to be safe in their surroundings, uh, to help to prevent crimes and promote fire safety. This report contains detailed information on how to report crimes as well as to respond, the response by the university to specific incidents such as uh, sexual assaults, missing students, and alcohol and drug use. This year's report also contains the sexual misconduct and interpersonal uh, violence rights and resource guide. And this guide was created to provide survivors and their support system with information about their rights or resources following an incident of interpersonal violence. The Clary Report, and we'll go over this, the Clary Report's really broken down to three different sections. And the first section of the Clary Report is our requirements, our Clary requirements that um, we meet the standards of the 1986, uh, the, actually the uh, 1990 uh, law, um, and we're required to, to make sure we post that by October 1st. Um, the Clary Report also defines the crimes that are reportable under the Campus Security Act, and it contains not only statistical information for last year, but also the two previous years. So this year is the 2022, will not, we're not required to post that information until October of next year, and we're already working on that. So this report is, is prepared by my office, uh, the Department of, of Public Safety, but it's also truly a, a collaboration and partnership with uh, Vice President Reynolds, uh, uh, different units that she has, including HRL, the you know, Students Office, uh, Student Conduct, and, and uh, Enterprise Risk Management. <clears throat> I want to just talk a little bit about campus geography, um, some of the challenges that we have with that, what, what we're required to report. Um, 
that first part where adjacent roadways and sidewalks is very important. Um, you know, an example the captain was uh, gave to me the other day was we have a Dunkin' Donuts across the street from our our uh, SEPS campus up in Providence. And if there are crime happens on that sidewalk, a clarity reportable crime, and we'll talk about those 11 required uh, clarity reportable crimes, we have to report that. If something happens inside the Dunkin' Donuts, we don't have to report that. So we have those challenges. We have a really good working relationship with those local uh, police agencies that, that we have not only our main campus, but our satellite campuses. This also includes the, the nine campus buildings um, owned and controlled by, by the institution, our sailing facility, um, and some of our research buildings on, on Liberty Lane. We go into the next. And I, and I mentioned earlier, not only does this clarity report um, for statistical information about our Kingston campus, but also with our, our four satellite campuses and also our ship, the Endeavor, our, our research vessel. So these are the 11 required uh, clarity reportable crimes that we um, are required to report out. The, the clarity report is really broken down to four, four different sections in terms of the clarity crimes, the Violence Against Women Act off offenses, which includes domestic violence, dating violence, and stalking. And I'll show you how it's broken down into the Clary Report. Our arrest for, these are other crimes. So we have two parts of this, the arrest part, which is for weapons, drugs, and alcohol. And then it's the referral part to student conduct. So it could be either or, we could either make an arrest or and um, do the referrals to student conduct to the Dean of Students Office for those three weapons violation, drugs and alcohol. It also includes uh, the hate crime section in terms of the 11 clary crimes, plus larceny, intimidation, simple assault and van vandalism. And we'll talk a little bit about, we had a couple uh, that we reported last year. Um, the Attorney General's office in the state now has a new civil rights hate crimes unit. And we actually now have a supervisor, our, pro, our prosecution and court officer, Sergeant Cortella, has got received extensive training, come back, trained all our officers in terms of hate crimes and civil rights violations. Whenever we have an incident that we think is, is related to hate crimes based on bias, we work with the Attorney General's office to classify that. So they actually, boots on the ground, they come out and we, we go through that with them. Who reports these crimes? Um, so our campus security authorities, again, if you, we had a hard copy here on page 10, it talks about who's responsible. Um, and we have, we, we probably have over 20 different um, uh, campus security authorities. We also uh, train them in our bright space in terms of, um, what is required, and we also send them different letters twice a year in terms of anything that's reported to them, they need to forward that to, to us. And then our police chiefs, our local police chiefs includes all the jurisdiction in terms of where we have satellite campuses, our main campus, and also along with the Rhode Island State Police who has statewide jurisdiction um, through, throughout the state. So just to get a little bit into our crimes, and I'm not sure if you could see that, but our clarity report, if you focus again, we have to, we're required to have this year, which is 2021, along with the two previous years. And if you go along, you'll see for rapes um, on campus, resident halls in total on campus was 10, fondling was one. And I'll answer some questions if any, and, and the captain can answer some of those questions too. For that second section in terms of, I, can they see that bottom part? Mm -hmm. So the arrest is the top part of that, where we make a criminal arrest and we refer them to district court. And the bottom part is that is for the, for the weapons, drugs, and alcohol is for referrals that we make to the dean of students office. So to see a majority of those refer alcohol. Also our VAWA, our Violence Against Women's Act, the requirements in terms of the statistical information that we're required to report there. If you see on the bottom, those are what pages it is on our clarity report. 
You know, I mentioned earlier about how the Clary report is, is broken down. Um, not only does it have our crime stats, but it also has the, the resource guide educational. It's an educational tool um, that's used for, for faculty, staff, and for our students. It also has all the university policies and procedures. And, and those, I believe there's 11 different policies and procedures that it covers. The Clary report doesn't only contain criminal criminal um, violations, but also we're required to report our fire statistical information and what we do for educational um, in terms of fire drills, evacuation processes. Um, and then we do an educational component. We work with Frankie's group with, H with HRL and our RAs to talk about different things that um, are prohibited in terms of what they can and can't bring here onto campus. We break down that, if you look at that statistical information on there, it will break it down to the cause of the fire, um, the damage exactly, if it's intended or unintentional, all of them have been unintentional, and also what the estimated cost for the damage. And we, we're not only required to do that in our resident halls, but also in our Greek <coughs> that are on our campus too. Okay. You know, our, our, our campus is very safe. I'm, a, I'm extremely proud of, of all the members of the Department of Public Safety. Um, you know, how hard they work every day to make sure that our campus is a safe, welcoming, vibrant uh, community to live, uh, learn, visit, work in. Um, our officers are probably the best trained officers in New England. Uh, we, we, you know, we, we see different challenges. Uh, with our community where maybe some municipalities don't see those challenges um, in terms of mental health response, well-being, checks, uh, persons in crisis. Um, so our officers will receive uh, a lot of additional training uh, and we're, we've been very fortunate in terms of that. And again, we have a very good working relationship internally uh, with, with different departments uh, that that help us build trust and confidence with, with, with our, all our community members. I think that's very important. You know, some of the things that we've seen um, in the last few years after the George Floyd incident and, and some other incidents throughout our country uh, where the Department of Justice has come in and put consent decrees, I think that's very important in terms of um, working in partnership to solve our problems, to address concerns, and really to build that the trust and confidence with our communities. How many how many security officers do we have in the Kingston campus? So Tom, you know, we, we have, we're a fully functioning police department. We have 33 police officers. Those officers go through the Municipal Training Academy, the Post Academy. So they're fully certified. They go through the academy with our municipal counterparts. Um, and some of, again, our last class, uh, Nicole Wagner graduated number one out of that uh, class. Um, our police officer, uh, community police officer, Paul Harrahan, received the uh, recognition uh, throughout the state as the community police officer of the year. So we, to answer your question, we have 33 sworn police officers who have arrest powers, and then we have 19, 19 security officers throughout our, really our, our three main campuses in terms of Kingston, uh, the Bay Campus and our SEPS Campus. And we also have a police officer assigned to each campus, our SEPS Campus, our Nursing, our NEC Campus, and our Bay Campus. Uh, unfortunately, our, our Bay Campus uh, officer just retired, so right now we have, we, we added an extra security officer to that site right now. Um, and especially with the different things that are going on with that uh, campus, um, with the transformation going on there, we're going to Try to get another police officer as soon as possible. I had, a um, I had a question on two questions. One, I know we have the Clary report, but do you have anything that you monitor differently that unique to URI? You know, maybe it's geographic areas on campus that have a propensity for crime or attacks or specific dorms or off campus. I mean, I know the the Clary report is is general and it's and it's obviously we, we need to comply with that 
um, from a regulatory standpoint, but do you have some areas, Mike, that you monitor um, that are particular, the unique to URI? And then two, what does the student survey say about how students feel about security on campus? I seem to remember, and it could be a few years ago, that that was an area that there was a flag that was raised. In other words, going to parking lots and lighting and those issues where some students didn't feel safe. And I don't know if Hannah has any can comment on that from her perspective or what she hears from others. But that's it's an area, obviously, that's a concern. It's an area of concern for parents. And so I was just curious if you can comment on that. Sure. Tom, yeah, great questions. So to address the first question about you know, particular area hot spots, uh, we like to call them. We, we're fortunate that we have a CAT RMS system here that really focuses on calls for service. Um, just, just, just to let you know, we, we've done about 21,174 calls for service just in the month of September, and, and we're going to do well over 15,000 calls for service um, for the year. What does that mean? What does that mean to call for service? Uh, about 90% of those calls of service are initiated by the public. The public are calling us to come to help them with some kind of need. It could be anything simple as a lockout, you know, jumpstart a car, okay. uh, help them get into the room. Um, and it could be something more, more serious in terms of a, a crime, one of those 11 uh, clearly reportable crimes. But those, those calls for services is, is kind of what we pride ourselves on in terms of being able to respond pretty promptly to the needs of our community. So we look at our CAT RMS system and we've, we've changed the way we patrol this university in terms of we have patrol st structures now, sectors, where our police officers, we have buy-in where they take those patrol sectors all the time and they get to develop those relationships with those community members. So it could be the resident halls in the evenings. It could be the academic corridor during the day. It could be the dining areas um, during, during those heavy times of, of use. Um, and that's how we really address those quality of life issues. And we also help in terms of being omnipresent and, and de deterring crime. That's one of the things with, with policing that we don't get enough credit for is, you know, how much, how many crimes that we really uh, the tour and the obby presence. Um, so we, we're constantly looking at our crime stats and, and changing the way we police in terms of that. We, we really, and to answer part of that is your second question about our community policing philosophy. And it's not just having our police officers in patrol cars, it's getting them out on foot and, and on bike. Nice. We, we just recently purchased four electric uh, battery operated bikes. And you'll see our officers, they've been certified in, in bike patrol and they're out there. And I think that's a yeah. lot better way of uh, uh, policing. It's more professional, it's more proactive in terms of um, engaging our community members. Our, our community members feel like they can um, approach our police officers um, a lot easier in terms of you know the traditional police car. Yeah. That's great, great. So uh, that community policing uh, philosophy is something that you know, we, we have a full-time community police officer. We just actually promoted him to corporal. Uh, he, he's done over 12 events already uh, this this um, this semester. And, and it's something that all our police officers buy into in terms of community policing, about partnerships, building the trust and confidence. Um, and, and we have a PSAC in terms of it's a police student advisory council and we work with our student senate and twice a year we actually walk boots on the ground and we have a lot of different partners there including uh, student affairs and hr hrl and uh, facilities and we look at safety and security issues we look at lighting we look at blue light phones we just recently did a test of our all blue light phones and our, our alert system um, so I think that's very important. And, and we develop uh, relationships there. We also have a Citizen Police Academy, which is is actually, um, we, we, we got more um, more participants than we thought we were gonna get. I think we have over 35 and we've been doing that. And we that's a lot of our campus community members, including not only our students, but some faculty and, and staff that participate in that. And it's an opportunity to showcase 
um, our, our department and, and everything that we do. So I hope I answer those two questions for you. Yep. How about the student survey on security? Yeah, so I, I think that's part of it. We just recently, uh, about three weeks ago, I met with student senate to get feedback from them. And and, and believe it or not, the the um, the bulk of the questionings was related to tap transportation and parking, which which, <laughs> yeah. uh, which falls underneath me. But a lot of good feedback. You know, what I think our challenges, and, and I'm up for the challenge, is. My old job with the Connecticut State Police and Mike's with Cranston, when we when you come into these communities, these different areas of, of the community, you build relationships, you build those bonds, but our community changes every four years. So we right. have to be on our game in terms of building those relationships, building trust and confidence and, and, and forging those partnerships and those. Um, I, I think that's that's why it's so um, rewarding to be in, our, in the position that we are. We really. We really do you want to add anything? Uh, I think it's just great that we have the opportunity and I'll I'll hop on community policing because the chief uh, when he came here several years ago was the major really brought a change in our community policing objectives. And I see it because I'm out there a lot of times with Corporal Hanrahan when he's out there with the grill giving away hot dogs and popcorn and grilled cheese. And we've given away hundreds and hundreds and hundreds already this year. And the relationship between him, the students, the officers that are there, Everybody is so thankful and these relationships last beyond just having something to eat because we've had people myself and Corporal Hanrahan have gone to different uh, student organizations and to some of the uh, sororities and fraternities and spoken with the students about issues of safety, sexual assault, alcohol use, uh, DUI and things like that. And they always come back up to the quad when they were there and they always remind us Hey, you guys came and talked to our house last year. When are you guys coming back again? I mean, if, if that to me, when I first started here 17 years ago after 27 in Cranston, that was unheard of for students to come up to the police and say, when are you going to come and address our house again? We have, we really enjoyed your conversation. So I think right now, in the, I've seen a big metamorphosis in this department in the 17 years I've been here. Um, I think it's uh, been nothing. We have the best relationship with the student body I think we've ever had. And I think we have the best relationship with our counterparts in the university than we've ever had over the last few years. And I that's why hey, I'm I'm 65 years old. I could retire tomorrow, but I'm still staying here because I, I love what I do. Great. Good to hear. Tom, can I add? Yeah, anybody. Yeah, yeah no, I just wanted to uh, certainly confirm uh, from the perspective of uh, the sense of community and participation in the community. It is a really great team to work with. And uh, those hundreds of hot dogs, I had three the other night. Uh, <laughs> it's, uh, they're pretty good, but uh, yeah, and it's it's great that, you know, Corporal Paul is riding his bike all over. So they're, they're very present and you see them just everywhere from sporting events to, so it's actually a very uh, lovely relationship. And I think, you know, very professional, very uh, forward looking. And I, I think we're really, this is, Certainly for the University of Rhode Island, a big deal. Fantastic. Hannah, do you have any comments? Um, I would just say that my experience thus far, like with the police department on campus, like when I lived on campus and I was very new to the college experience, like I, when I first came to school, I was very nervous about if there were any scary parts of campus, but that was soon like very much washed away from my brain because I always felt very safe on campus and I always thought they did an amazing job. And um, even now that I'm not on campus, I still feel like very safe and all, all my friends are there and they feel safe. So they really do a great job and I haven't heard of any complaints. Fantastic. Any other uh, comments, questions? Yeah, Tom, I only have one. This is Mike. Um, the it, 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 congratulations. It does look it's statistically it, it this there's not not much in the way of crime going on, which is great. The only one that concerned me was it, it, it looked to be I could be reading it wrong to be a significant jump in rapes. I mean, it is uh, what is what is going on there? It, it, I, I and I think Ellen may be able to help to address that, but I would say it's. I don't believe that there's a, a significant increase in the amount, but I think now um, survivors are more 
willing to come forward and at least seek help and services. Um, they, all these numbers don't only reflect what comes to the police department because we still only get a handful of reports ourselves, but they do come, they go through Ellen's shop and I'll let her address her shop because they're more comfortable reporting these things, which is, which is really important. Yeah, so I'll just reiterate that. We do, just so you know, uh, training for all first year students are required to have it through their first year seminar. And really we see a direct correlation with their education and the number of reports. But we also, so violence prevention advocacy services, um, Kelly Ryan is an exceptional individual who works with these students uh, and survivors and is confidential. So they students have the ability to come to her. So not all reports, actually make it to the police, just so you know, or make it into this report. Um, but I don't believe there's increased numbers. I think that they really are a direct report of students hearing about the resources available, uh, receiving services, and then actually recording them, where previously they didn't have the education or the, the awareness of where they would report or the, or the feeling of support from the institution or a dedicated response. So I think that that's a big part of it right now. There's still more to be done, um, certainly. And I also think that when you look at some of the numbers, they were lower in 1920 because our population was lower. Remember, we were down, if you remember, down uh, quite a significant amount, at least 20 percent. And so during those years and times, things were a little bit different. But um, it does appear that we're having increased reports, um, but I'm not sure that they translate to in increased number of cases. It's more reports. Ms. Bracknally, if I may interject, in the sense I don't underscore the points that I think that 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 uh, uh, Mr. Shamick and 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 Dr. Reynolds have scored. One, I think the issue of what's reported and what's occurred are very very different, and we're seeing again through a lot of measures that we're encouraging more reporting. Secondarily, just because an incident is not reported, there are various support systems for the victim is uh, or the survivor in that situation is empowered to choose the path that they want to do, which may not include in, including a police report, but may record uh, accessing themselves to, to support services as well. And as someone who's had the benefit of working at prior institutions before coming here to Rhode Island, I can tell you that our statistics, and I'll defer to, uh, to Chief Jagoda on how IACLIA may compare those benchmarkings, but these are good standards. These, I mean, this is a relatively, in, in comparison to the places that I've worked that are comparable or larger size than this proportionally, these are very good statistics. So I think we have a lot to be proud of in the efforts of our uh, public safety force and the concurrent agencies that support our students in dealing with this. Is there always work to be done? Certainly. Um, but, but again, in comparison, looking at my experience, I think we're doing a good job. Of course, we can always do more and better. I think that's a significant selling point for the university, especially for parents of, you know, young kids coming to a university selling this, you know, that, that URI is a safe choice. I mean, that, that's something we should brag, something we should brag about. Thanks, Mike. And we do. We tell that story regularly and try to to make sure that students and families understand that this is a really safe and community that we have here. Okay. Uh, many other comments, questions? Thank you, uh, Ellen and Mike and the team for the update. And if there's, you know, we're, we're always asking you guys questions and pushing you, but if you, you need some, something from the board, um, you can come to, uh, in, in this particular area, you can come to myself or David, and then we'll bring it to the committee and the entire board. Um, we want to have that kind of openness and transparency that you can go directly to board members. So, okay, um, with that, mm -hmm. uh, next item on the agenda is item number three, which is to adjourn. I uh, have a motion to adjourn. Motion, Mike Fastatelli. Second, David Monterano. I'll ask for a voice vote. All in favor, please say yes. 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 Don't hear any, you're seeing any no's, no abstentions. <clears throat> meeting is adjourned and we will be meeting on February 23rd um, is our next committee meeting. Okay, thank you all.